Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop on improving scientific writing. I'm uh, Dr. Sajid Mohamin Choudhury. I'm the chair of the IEEE YP Bangladesh. And today we are going to have the session in two parts from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We are going to show some of the pre recorded. Uh, record, uh, pre-recorded uh, lecture videos of Dr. Sainali, which were hosted in the Coursera website. So we are going to be playing those. And at seven o'clock, uh, Professor Sainali is going to join us. So for the first part, we're not going to record the session since these are already available for free in Coursera's website. And at seven o'clock, we would uh, start recording the session. And with Professor Sainali's uh, present, uh, permission, we would be sharing the recordings in our YouTube channel, if she permits. So with this, uh, let's uh, begin the session. So our original goal was to have the pre-recorded sessions uh, played throughout the day from October 16th morning. But uh, later, what I found out that it's uh, easier to watch them in the Coursera's website uh, directly as the video size is uh, much smaller than what you would get from Zoom streaming. So if any one of you are experiencing uh, connection problems, you are free to go to Coursera's website and then uh, watch the recordings. I'm going to play some uh, videos from week six of writing in the science. So which would cover plag plagiarism, authorship, and journals for this session. So without further ado, let's uh, move on to the session. Review is going to be published online tends to make you more constructive and more positive. I've actually gone back and edited my comments to be more upbeat because I didn't want to come across as overly negative and mean. So open peer review does encourage a more friendly tone. There's also something called post-publication review. There's a lot of this going on informally. People comment uh, in blogs on papers and on Twitter. This is a way of vetting papers that got through peer review but might still have problems in them. And more formal channels for post-publication review are starting to emerge, such as PubMed Commons. We're about to get started with the live session of the workshop on improving scientific writing. So we're going to start with a short video presentation regarding IEEE and uh, the young professionals. IEEE, the world's largest professional organization striving to advance technology for humanity. And today, we want to tell you about our strategic plan for the future. But who is IEEE? We're a global community of more than 426,000 members in over 160 countries around the globe. We have 45 societies and technical councils and 10 geographic regions supporting our worldwide technology community. And each year, we publish over 160 publications and hold more than 1,600 conferences. Our digital library, IEEE Explore, houses nearly 4 million scholarly scientific documents. Working closely with industry, we have developed more than 1,600 internationally recognized standards and projects. In total, IEEE is one of the largest knowledge generators for technology professionals across governments, academia, and businesses. Our mission and vision for the future are simple, yet profound. Our mission, we foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. Our vision, we will be essential to the global technical community and to technical professionals everywhere. 
and be universally recognized for the contributions of technology and of technical professionals in improving global conditions. The four goals of our strategic plan are to expand and enable dynamic, nimble, flexible, diverse communities to help individuals from around the world to share, collaborate, network, debate, and engage with one another. Provide technically vital forums for the discussion, development, and dissemination of authoritative knowledge related to traditional technologies while focusing more of our resources towards serving the professionals working on emerging and disruptive technologies. Lead humanitarian efforts around the world to use technology to solve the world's most challenging problems. Leverage IEEE's technology-related insight to provide governments, NGOs and other organizations, and the public with innovative, practical recommendations to address public policy issues. In order to support these goals, we are engaging in several key initiatives. Provide more opportunities, products, and services aimed at increasing our value to professionals working in the industry, particularly younger professionals and entrepreneurs. Ensure the vitality and relevance of our core activities in standards, conferences, education, and publications while providing increased value to our members. Develop programs in public service focused on knowledge and technology in our fields of interest related to public policy and humanitarian efforts. If you would like to download our complete strategic plan, you can find it at the IEEE website. Hi, do you know why we should engage with IEEE Young Professionals early in our career? Well, what is IEEE Young Professionals and how can it help us? IEEE Young Professionals is an international community of enthusiastic, dynamic, and innovative members and volunteers. Any IEEE member can be a young professional, and any member who received their first professional degree within the last 15 years is automatically considered a YP. Now, IEEE Young Professionals is bigger than you may think. It is one community in 10 regions across 183 affinity groups and more than 120,000 members around the world. So why should we engage with IEEE Young Professionals, you ask? It is a place to connect and network with other professionals, enrich our career and personal lives, and participate in social events and activities. We can participate in many professional networks such as IEEE Collaboratech, IEEE email account via Google Apps, and take part in local meetings and online activities such as conferences and job fairs. We can also access the IEEE Center for Leadership Excellence for on-demand content. This really is an excellent resource to equip us with professional development skills. The benefits go on and on, particularly for young professionals early in our career as well as students. We can enhance our technical skills by accessing EVO Classics, IEEE Member Digital Library, Spectrum and Potential Magazine, IEEE Explore, conferences, and more. Look, the bottom line is this. We can participate in exciting local events and global webinars for topics such as assessing emotional intelligence, fundamentals for leadership and ethics, serious networking for engineers, survival guide for scientific writing, conflict management, negotiation tactics, and others. For all these great reasons, engaging with IEEE Young Professionals may be one of the best decisions that we can make in our personal lives and professional career development. That is why we should engage with IEEE Young Professionals. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the live session of today's uh, workshop, which is uh, the workshop on improving scientific writing. And today we are extremely glad that uh, Professor Christine Sainani, uh, who was the co-author of the course uh, online videos that we saw. So she is uh, uh, with us to deliver her uh, talk. So let me give a brief introduction of uh, Professor Sainani. So she's an associate professor at the Stanford University and also is health and science writer. After receiving an MS in statistics and a PhD in epidemiology from Stanford University, she studied science writing in the University of California, Santa Cruz. 
She taught statistics and writing at the Stanford for more than a decade and has received several excellence in teaching awards from the graduate program in epidemiology. Dr. Sainani writes about science and health for a range of audiences. She has authored the health column uh, Body News for Allure magazine for a decade, and she's also a statistical editor for the Journal of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation. And she uh, authors a statistical column called Statistically Speaking for this journal. So when I first uh, came across the Coursera online uh, courses, uh, through, where they solicited our university to be a partner. So I was uh, looking forward to improve my scientific writing and where I came across uh, Professor Sainani's course. And I also dig through a little bit through her uh, biography. And what really fascinated me is uh, for us who are in the academia, uh, writing is sometimes, uh, especially for non-native uh, English speakers, writing is the necessary evil that we have to g get along with, uh, apart uh, just to get across our research to the world and uh, to get the citations for, to advance our career. So for uh, Professor Sainani, she's a person who enjoys writing and then she actually went to a professional writing career, even after completing her PhD in epidemiology. This really fascinated me. And also her lecture delivery, her clear way of explaining everything regarding scientific writing has made me uh, realize my likings of my writing. And then I always work uh, towards uh, improving myself. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to bring her uh, sh to share her talk so that the young engineers and uh, young graduate students of our country could be introduced uh, to the art of improving scientific writing, especially since we're part of the IEEE. IEEE scientific journals have a notoriety to be unnecessarily jargon, uh, uh, unnecessarily complex or unnecessarily using complicated languages. Uh, and this is, uh, comes from a multidisciplinary team who prefer sometimes uh, physical society journals uh, compared to IEEE journals, since uh, these are more complicated to read. So hopefully with uh, the help of Professor Sainani, we can improve our writing style and make our writing more interesting to a broad range of audience. So with this, I would like to invite uh, Professor Sainani to give her uh, talk and share her talk with us. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chaudhry, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. And um, I do want to you know, keep this interactive, so if you have questions along the way, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, um, and I will leave plenty of uh, time for questions at the end. Um, I'm going to give um, a talk here, but really I'd love to have a, a dialogue and a, and a conversation as well. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk about why you want to write like a scientist, because uh, poor writing, I think, does a lot of harm to science. And it's sort of one of these under-talked about, we don't spend enough time, we worry a lot about, you know, I do a lot of statistics, we worry a lot about bad statistics and bad study design, but we don't spend enough time talking about how poor writing does harm to science and what we can do about it. And so my take on messages for today, I think that much of the scientific literature, unfortunately, is gobbledygook. It's really badly written. And um, it, that's a big problem. It has important consequences. And I think you guys can all do better than the status quo. And when I think of you know, science today, I, it reminds me of the Charles Dickens quote. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. I, I feel like we're a little bit <laughs> that in science right now because um, you know, we've made so many amazing advances in science. We've sequenced the human genome. We have cars now that can drive themselves. Um, we have amazing new therapies in cancer. So we're doing really well on the one hand in science. On the other hand, uh, we have a reckoning in science where there's a realization that a lot of things that are published are not really high quality, are not reproducible. Uh, this is a famous a study that came out in 2005 by Johnny Anidis, a colleague of mine at Stanford, it called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. It's one of the most cited papers ever because when he published that, we all went, yeah, there's something about that. There's a lot of published research that is false, that is non-reproducible. Um, and, you know, it's been, it's even reached the popular media, oh, uh, problems with scientific research. Um, 
And so we have a reproducibility crisis going on. Uh, we have a problem with, with uh, the public's perception of science too. There's a astounding amount of science denial and misinformation going around. There are people out there not vaccinating their children against childhood diseases. Um, so we have a communication problem, not just within science, but with the larger public. Um, and you might think, well, where does writing fit into all that? Why, why am I talking about writing with regards to science's problems? Well, I think part of the problem uh, comes from the fact that we do a poor job with communication. And I think we really have to teach scientists to write better. And I think there are some important consequences from poor scientific writing. So one, it slows scientific progress. So if you have to spend a lot of time reading through an article many times in order to be able to understand what it even says, that's going to slow scientific advancements. And if you, uh, as I already mentioned, it fuels the reproducibility crisis. Um, because I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I think bad scientific writing also enables you know, pseudoscience to flourish. And I think it again undermines public trust in science. We'll say a little bit more about all of those consequences in a minute here. But I'm actually gonna just start with some examples. So I see that you've watched some of my uh, lectures from the Coursera course. So you've seen some of my examples. I'll, I'll pull out now a, a, another few of my favorite uh, examples. I should say that I don't give exact citations on examples that I'm criticizing because my intent is not to criticize those particular authors, uh, but rather these are examples actually that are representative of the literature. And I'll start here with uh, one of my favorite examples that was from a paper that I was actually reading in the oncology literature because I was writing a magazine article about it for a general audience. So it's some really important science about immunotherapy for cancer. Uh, but I went to read the paper and I needed to understand it to be able to write about it for a lay audience. And here's the first sentence of that paper. And it says, adoptive cell transfer immunotherapy is based on the ex vivo selection of tumor reactive lymphocytes and their activation and numerical expression before reinfusion into the autologous tumor bearing host. And I don't know about you, but I have trouble parsing that sentence. I think my favorite part of that sentence is the autologous tumor-bearing host. If you, if you stop for a minute and think about that, who is the autologous tumor-bearing host? Well, that's, that's the patient, right? That's a really uh, almost dehumanizing way to say the patient. Um, so since I had to understand this paper, I actually had to Google around to find a better definition of this therapy. And actually, I found a great definition on Nature Reviews Cancer. They defined it as adoptive cell therapy uses a cancer patient's own T lymphocytes with anti-tumor activity expanded in vitro and reinfused into the patient. That is much more understandable to me. Um, and so that better writing immediately makes it clear to me. I can spend much less time tripping over all the words because now I understand what uh, is, this therapy does. Um, and I, I always tell young students, uh, when you're struggling to read the scientific or the engineering literature, um, you might think as a, as a young student that the problem is with you, right? When I was a student, I would try to read these things and I would think, you know, the problem is I'm not, uh, you know, I, have, I don't have enough experience and I, I don't have enough knowledge and I'm not smart enough, right? I'm older and wiser now and I know better. I know that if I am having trouble reading an article, the problem is not with me, it's with the authors. They've done a poor job writing. And so I would tell students to keep this in the back of your mind when you're reading papers, it's not me, it's the authors, right? It's not your problem if you can't read it. They've done something wrong. All right, so I was reviewing a, a study a few months ago, and um, this was the AIMS statement of this study. So it says, as such, the purpose of this study was to present the development of a theoretical model of factors and potential relationships and processes explaining variation in workability based on a thorough assessment of biopsychosocial variables in patients with cervical reticulopathy. Now that's a very long-winded, you can hear when you read things out loud how wordy they get, it's a very long-winded AIM statement, and it's hard, again, to parse. Um, my favorite part of this example is the theoretical model of factors and potential relationships and processes explaining variation. If you step back from that one for a minute, you'll realize, what is a model that explains variation? That is just a regression model. It's a really fancy way of saying a regression model. Uh, actually, in, in your AIM statement of your paper, you don't necessarily need to say what statistical method you use. So I advise to them to rewrite this as just the aim for the study was to identify risk factors for impaired workability in patients with cervical reticulopathy. 
That was the whole point of the study. It was just to find risk factors for this disease. Um, but it's buried in that first version. All right, another one of my favorite examples. This uh, comes from a published paper in a top sports medicine journal. And I love this example because they're doing research about napping. <laughs> so napping is not rocket science, right? We all understand napping. There is nothing uh, even that a lay person shouldn't be able to understand about napping. Uh, I'm gonna read this example though in a minute and you'll see that they're trying to make napping sound really, really complicated. So it says, considerable attention has been paid to napping as an effective countermeasure for arousal decline and for improving cognitive performance. The previous literature has demonstrated that naps less than 30 minutes undermine the deleterious impacts of sleep deprivation that affects arousal and performances. It has also been reported that naps enhance arousal levels even when the quality and the quantity of the previous nocturnal sleep are adequate. It would be of interest to mention that the differences in results found in previous researches depend on the diversity of factors that determine the benefits acquired when taking short naps. Indeed, factors like the quality of prior nocturnal sleep, sleep architecture, and the temporal placements of the nap during the day may determine the extent of benefits gained through short naps. So that is a really, really long-winded way to say we're doing research on naps, right? Um, my favorite part of this example is they talk about the temporal placements of the nap during the day. Well, that's just a fancy way of saying the timing of the nap, right? So I took a stab at translating this one, and I was able to get it a lot shorter. I think everything that they're trying to say is, Short naps improve alertness and cognitive performance in individuals who are sleep deprived, as well as those with adequate nightly sleep. However, the extent of the benefits may vary depending on factors such as the quality of the prior night's sleep and nap timing. I think that's all they are trying to say. You can say it in much shorter, much fewer words, um, and then it's much easier on your reader. Uh, one more, uh, this one says, lettuce is highly appreciated for its nutritional properties. However, microbial contamination through the food chain and its raw consumption may jeopardize these known benefits to the diet. The objective of this study was to determine the role of the consumer at the stage of washing at home in relation to the probability of illness due to the presence of listeria in lettuce. Again, you can hear it's quite wordy when you read it out loud. I took a stab at editing this one. I think what they're trying to say is raw lettuce is nutritious, but it can be contaminated with disease-causing microbes. We tested the ability of several at-home washing methods to remove listeria from lettuce. All right, just one more here. This one says, certainly the usual methods for the emulation of small talk that paved the way for the investigation of rasterization do not apply in this area. In the opinions of many, despite the fact that conventional wisdom states that this grand challenge is continuously answered by the study of access points, we believe that a different solution is necessary. Now, as you're reading along in this one, you might think to yourself, I, I don't understand it, probably because I don't have any background in this area. This one actually comes out of computer science. You might assume again that the problem is with you. I have a confession to make on this one though. This one is actually not real. This is a completely fake and nonsensical paper that was automatically generated by a computer. Uh, there's some scientists at MIT who came up with this program and the computer generates nonsensical scientific articles but they have complete sentences, they kind of sound scientific sounding. And so, um, and they did this because they wanted to see if they could get these papers accepted to computer science conferences and, and they did and including this paper was accepted to a computer science conference, which I, I think is a little bit sad, right? That we, you know, in science can't differentiate between real writing and fake writing because the state and the quality of writing in the literature is so poor. So again, if you're having trouble re reading an article, just remember it's not you, it's the authors. And what are some hallmarks of these examples? Well, they're all hard to understand. They're boring to read, right? I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the scientific literature is frankly very boring to read. It doesn't have to be that way. These examples are needlessly complex and wordy. They contain a lot of gratuitous jargon, unnecessary jargon. They use really big words to describe small ideas, like the temporal placements of the nap during the day or the autologous tumor bearing post. And they use a lot of words that say nothing, vague or completely meaningless prose. And there's evidence that the problem is actually getting worse in science, not better. And so there's a great study that was done in, uh, published in eLife in 2017. And the researchers examined about 700,000 abstracts from 123 journals in 12 fields. And they, they measured the text readability of those abstracts. They put it through an automatic reading checker to get uh, readability. And so you can see the results here on the right. This is the year of publication graphed against readability. For readability, high scores are good, low scores are bad. And you can see, unfortunately, that readability in the last 
century in science has really gone down. And just a little bit more about uh, the scales that they use. So one of the readability checkers they use, there's actually a link here, www.checktext.org. You can actually check your own text and it will give you a readability score. It'll also check you for plagiarism. Um, but it's called the flesh reading e-scale. It's a really simple measure. It's not gonna be a perfect measure because it's, you know, it's very simple, but it's some proxy for readability. Um, and so what they do is they just count up the total number of words in a sentence and they look at the average number of syllables per word. So how complex are your sentences? How complex are your words? Not, again, not a perfect measure of readability, uh, but gives you a pretty good sense of it. Um, the scale ranges from 100, meaning very readable, to zero, meaning extremely hard to read. Um, plain English is considered around a 60 to 70. 40 is considered difficult. 10 to 20 is considered very difficult. So how are we doing in the scientific literature? This uh, study went out to 2015. So in 2015, we were at an average score of 10 in the literature, and these are in abstracts. Um, that's really not great, right? That's highly, highly difficult to read. And I, just for fun, I plugged in two of my examples, the uh, immunotherapy example and the cervical reticulopathy example. Those scored 12.4 and 14.9, so very much in line with the current scientific literature. Those are not anomalies, those two examples. Um, interestingly, I took the rewrites of those examples that I showed you, and I plugged those into the, the check text, and those scored 36 and 37. So that's still not, you know, easy to read. Nobody said the scientific literature is going to be totally easy to read. Um, but imagine if we could bring up the entire scientific le literature to that level of readability. Imagine how that would help science. And again, why does this matter? Uh, you know, this is one of my like missions in life to get scientists to write better because I think it's one of the most underrecognized problems in science. Again, we spend a lot of time, you know, I do a lot of statistics and we spend a lot of time <clears throat> worrying about poor statistics and poor study design and other things. We spend too little time worrying about communication in science. And I think it has all of these consequences and I'll go into each one of these a little bit more now. Um, but I really do think bad, bad scientific writing is the root of a lot of problems in science. So for one, it's slow scientific progress, right? If you can't read something, or if it takes you a really long time to read it, that's going to slow scientific advancement. How many times have you had to sit there and struggle over a paper? It's very hard to get knowledge across if it's, it takes a long time to understand it. Um, bad scientific writing, bad writing in general, is also tied to unclear thinking, right? If you can't quite figure out what it is you're trying to say, it makes it hard to write about it clearly. Um, but that's a marker of sloppy thinking. And sloppy thinking, of course, leads to sloppy science. We don't really think things through. I think bad scientific writing also is problematic for the reproducibility crisis because it obscures both intentional and even unintentional cheating in science, right? A lot of times this gets into the statistic where people are um, doing things statistically that aren't quite right. If you can't understand what they did at all because you can't read their methods and it doesn't make a lot of sense, that can hide a lot of things. And all of that, again, fuels the reproducibility crisis, this idea in science that we're, you know, there's a lot of things that are published that maybe are not of high quality or are not reproducible. I also think bad scientific writing has a lot of effects on the public's perception of science. I think it both confuses the public and also excludes the public. And, you know, sometimes it seems like when you're reading a scientific paper, it's almost meant to exclude the public, right? We make it sound really complicated. We make napping sound like it's extremely complicated. So somebody who's a layperson is not gonna be able to read that article, but it's about napping. They should be able to read that article. And I, I do think that all of those consequences has the effect of making it <clears throat> easier for pseudoscience to flourish. People who are spreading misinformation, science denial, people who are spreading bad intentionally can do so because we're, you know, the public can't differentiate between pseudoscience and real science. And I think all of this undermines public trust in science, as we're seeing, unfortunately, in the current world. Um, one of my favorite all-time quotes, <laughs> this is something I, I saw in a newsletter way back when I started teaching, and I kept it in my slides because I, I think it's so true, and she writes, my professor friend told me that in his academic world, publisher parish is really true. He doesn't care if nobody reads it or understands it as long as it's published. And that's kind of sad, right? If we were doing all this work just so it can get published, but we don't care if anybody reads it or does anything with it, 
that doesn't that doesn't bode well for science, right? We need other people to be able to read our work and build on it in order for science to advance. Uh, again, I think poor writing fuels the reproducibility crisis, and I'll use an example from statistics because I got involved in debunking this statistical method that showed up in the sports science literature. I do some things in sports uh, medicine, um, and um, it, it's this method that got popular because it happens to give you a lot of false positives under certain conditions. And so of course people like false positives because then you find more things in your data. Um, and so it got popular for that reason. Um, but it's kind of hidden that there, that there are false, there are all these false positives and the creators of the method, you know, tried to pretend there weren't a lot of false positives. And, um, but part of the reason it became popular and was able to become popular and actually get used widely in the sports science literature is because a lot of the writing on it is nonsensical, but it's hard to tell it's nonsensical if you don't really read it carefully, because it kind of sounds good. It sounds scientific. It, it sounds like in some of the arguments put out there statistically, they sounded good. They, they sounded like, you know, we threw around a bunch of good statistical words. If you really parsed them, you realize that they were actually nonsensical. So I'm just giving a little uh, brief uh, example of a writing uh, of a, from a paper saying why they use this method. So they say this magnitude-based inference was chosen since it allows the emphasis of effect magnitudes and estimate precision, focusing on non-effect interpretation rather than on absolute effect. This analysis recognizes sample variability and provides scientists and professional coaches with an indicator of the practical meaningfulness of the outcomes. There's actually a lot in there that is totally nonsensical. And then they say there, was, there were no statistically significant differences between the non-runners and runners group in the CRP values for any of the pairs not analyzed. However, the magnitude-based inference enabled more precise tracking of differences between groups, and some of the differences were substantially clear. So we didn't find any statistically significant results, so we used this other method, and then magically, we found things. Um, and so you know, a lot of the language in here is just kind of nonsensical. It says like, this method is better because it allows the emphasis of effect magnitudes and estimate precision. Well, traditional statistics do that too. That's nothing special. And then it says focusing on non-effect interpretation rather than on absolute effect. I have no idea what that means. Um, then it says this analysis recognizes sample variability. Well, guess what? All statistical methods recognize sample variability. They're all based on sampling variability. So that's nothing unique. Um, and then again, I, as I said, they didn't find any statistically significant differences, meaning all the observed differences were within the range you might expect just to see just due to chance fluctuation. But then they said, well, oh, but our method, this method can do, you know, find, have more precise tracking of differences between groups. Well, well, how? How do you get more out of the data just by switching your method? You can't, right? And then sort of, sort of magically, all of a sudden, they're finding clear results that there's substantial differences between the groups. So all of that can be buried, though, in this, in this nonsensical writing that kind of sounds scientific, kind of sounds good. Um, poor writing, as I said, I think enables pseudoscience to flourish. So I'm going to show you two example passages here, and I want to see if you can tell which one is a real scientific passage and which one is pseudoscience. Um, and it's actually difficult to tell the difference. Um, so the first one says, one of those systems involves the observation of a cellular matrix and tensegrity, a lattice-like system of connective tissue that have the ability to communicate information. Another communication path that Oshman describes is the perineural control system also identified by the orthopedic surgeon and researcher Robert O. Becker. Becker recognized a layer of connective tissue surrounding each nerve fiber capable of communicating minute electrical signals based on the transverse ball effect. Criticality, and the second one says, criticality is a concept that refers to all neuronal networks that as dynamical systems might operate nearby critical points. Biological systems have a tendency to spontaneously reorganize to a criticality point between order and chaos, which is referred to as a self-organized criticality. For instance, intrinsic simulations or oscillations found in EEG studies are believed to be an evidence for self-organized criticality in brain networks, more precisely as evidence uh, for brain networks keeping balance around the hot bifurcation. Um, and all right, so I want you to think about which of those for a minute you think is the pseudoscience and which is the real science. I do have a question in the chat box. I'm just going to read that out. Uh, you've shown in a graph that the readability of scientific papers is decreasing. I also find many papers unnecessarily difficult and feel that it was, if it was written in an easier way, it would have attracted more students to the field. Why does this trend exist in scientific authors? What is the psychology behind it? Oh, that's a great question. 
Um, so I, I think it comes from a lot of places. I'm not an expert in psychology, certainly, but I think I can, I can speculate as to some of the factors. Why, why are we attracted? Why, why do we re keep repeating this kind of bad scientific writing? Even though as a student, we read this writing and we say, you know, I don't understand. Um, gosh, why isn't this more easy to read? Why isn't this more fun to read? Um, I think there's a couple of things. So one is if you are a student and you're reading this and your advisor writes like this, unfortunately, you try to emulate it, right? I mean, that's what students do. We think that what's out there and what's published must be good. So that must be the way we are expected to write in order to be successful in science. So there's sort of this myth that the bulk of the scientific literature is the, is the best way to write because those people get published, right? Um, Unfortunately, that's a self-perpetuating cycle, though, right? Because if, if new, the newest generation uh, copies what the old generation does, we're just going to have more of the same. Uh, I think it's also, you know, for students, let's think about who you're trying to write for. A lot of times, I don't think students are trying to write for a general audience or a, a lot of readers. Who are you trying to write for when you're a student? Well, you're trying to write for your advisor, understandably. And what are you trying to show your advisor? Well, you're trying to show your advisor that you learned all the big words, right? And that you know how to use those big words and that you can throw those technical terms around. And so I think there's sometimes a temptation, especially for young scientists, to want to show their knowledge and want to show that by using complicated big words. And, um, you know, they feel like if they do that, they'll be part of the club in science because that's the way science sounds. Um, and then I, I do think there's this maybe psychology that people think that if you use a lot of big, sophisticated words, you must be really smart, <laughs> right? And it's interesting because there's a really great study for, in psychology. Um, I don't have the reference on the top of my head, but it was published in maybe five, ten years ago, where they actually gave undergraduate students paragraphs in scientific paragraphs, and they had them read those paragraphs. Um, and some of them were written in a really verbose way, and some of them were written more simply. And they asked the students. Uh, to rate which authors they thought were smarter. And guess which one the authors rated as smarter? They rated the author of the simple paragraphs as smarter, right? And that's a little counterintuitive. You'd think that they would rate the really one, the ones that sound really big words and really complicated, but actually no, they rated the authors who were able to explain the science simply as smarter than the ones who had to use all of the big words. And so I think part of that psychology is we think those big words will make us sound smart, but actually it's just the opposite. So those are just some of my, my theories on it. Um, all right, so uh, which of these is the science and which of these is the pseudoscience? So, uh, in fact, the uh, pseudoscience is A. So this is actually a nonsensical explanation of how energy psychology, uh, healing cans and healing crystals and things like that, how it works. So this is like, oh, how the electricity gets from the crystal into your body and like does its magic. Um, the second one is actually from a paper in PLOS One, this is a real paper, and it's about decision making. But I can't read either one of those, so they both sound either like real science or pseudoscience, depending on your point of view uh, to me. All right, just one more for fun. So what the first one says, well, most sports drinks focus on sodium and potassium for electrolyte replacement. Proper hydration and muscle support rely on a balance of electrolytes. Alkaline, alkaline ionized water contains a blend of minerals, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, all electrically charged through ionization to create a more balanced blend of electrolytes. And the second one says, an advantage of a higher carbohydrate concentration is that carbohydrate oxidation can be enhanced, thereby improving endurance performance. It appears that a rate of carbohydrate ingestion of 30 to 60 grams per hour is required to achieve this. This rate of carbohydrate ingestion is difficult to obtain if low concentrations are used unless very large volumes are ingested. So again, which one is real? Which one is pseudoscience there? Um, so actually in this case, B is also science and the same as before. Um, it's actually from a well-cited review on hydration in a, in a good sports medicine journal. Um, the first one is advertising for something called alkaline ionized water, which has been sold as a health drink. It's, it's just expensive water, it's, it's, it's fish oil. Um, but, you know, again, it sounds kind of scientific, so you can throw around those scientific terms and people will believe you. And uh, I'm reading from the chat box, as, as you mentioned, it's increasingly getting challenging to engage generalized audiences to, uh, with traditional research papers, considering their low readability. I totally agree. 
while there may not be an easy solution to this, we can try a parallel simplified version for a general audience of our technical writings. That's a great idea. Yeah, so what some, some journals now, you have this concept of a lay abstract. Um, can you give a summary for a general audience? And I think that's really, really valuable. First of all, it forces you as a scientist to have to think about how to communicate to a wider audience. And then secondly, at least there's a summary that's very readable uh, for general audiences. And other scientists can use that summary too. I mean, if, if a journal offers a lay abstract, I go first to the lay abstract before I read the rest. That gives me a better understanding because that's the scientist actually trying to communicate and not just trying to write in a scientific way. So yeah, that's a great idea. Anytime you have an opportunity to try to write for a lay audience, it's a great exercise. It will improve your scientific writing. And then as talking about the public, I think poor writing undermines public trust in science. And I think, you know, it, if, I mean, think about it. If we can't understand the literature, if we struggle to understand the literature, how do we expect the public to make sense of science? If scientists have trouble telling the difference between what's real and what's unreal, again, how do we expect the public to do that? And I think the scientific literature is almost written in a style that's, it, sound, it almost seems like it's purposely excluding the public. I mean, we don't do it on purpose, but at some level, I think there's a, you know, a job security thing going on where we think if we write something that sounds really complicated, then we'll, we can preserve our jobs because nobody else can understand it. So it must be really hard, right? But that's just a terrible approach to science because when scientists communicate poorly, that opens the door for scientific misinformation, scientific denial, the, all the kinds of things we're seeing in the world today. I, I just took a clip from a, a website. This is actually, she ha this woman has an MD, but she's spreading terrible, mat, you know, bad information. Um, but it sounds, you know, it sounds kind of good if you don't, you know, because again, it, it's just throwing in scientific terms and um, sounds like scientific writing. But she says, moreover, if a woman has a persistent HPV infection, she has a problem with her immune system. The bottom line is the depression of her immune system is what's putting her at increased risk for cervical cancer. So while a vaccine might prevent cancer in one location, disease will manifest in another area if the root causes and address. Now this is total nonsense, total bunk. Um, but you know, it sounds kind of scientific, right? And so the public reads that and they're confused. They're confused about vaccines. All right, so what can everybody here do about it? So first of all, you can Try not to copy, not to emulate what you read in journals. Choose a different path. And you have to care whether anyone reads or understands your work. You actually have to think about the reader on the other end. And I think we don't do this enough in science. So I'm trained as a journalist. And as a journalist, we spend a lot of time thinking about the reader. I, I have to make this interesting to the reader. I have to make it understandable to the reader. Um, and it would be great if scientists did the same thing, but I, I think we rarely actually think about the reader. We kind of just think about getting it down on paper, getting it published, and we forget that the goal of a written piece is for somebody to read it. So we have to think about the reader. Um, a really good tip on writing is to try to figure out what you are trying to say before you sit down to write about it. It's hard uh, to be able to write clearly if you actually don't know what it is you're trying to say. Um, and so I actually think it's really helpful to, to talk out your writing. So I do a lot of writing in my car. I mean, not right now because of the pandemic, I'm not in my car as much, but like usually in normal times, I will <laughs> talk out my writing in my, in my car um, and try to like, you know, figure out what is it, what's the point I'm trying to make? And I'll do that out loud. And I won't I try to do it at a computer where it's a little bit intimidating. All right, I see we have another question in the, um, in the chat. So it says, a basic question often coming from students, mostly in undergrad level, while we teach them technical writing is how to differentiate between abstract and conclusion in a write-up. That's a great question. Obviously, abstract has a fixed word count, but at the same time, it's more sensitive as often readers only read the abstract through and authors may find it hard to keep it generally understandable. Yeah, I think so. So a couple of things. Um, the abstract is, is different than the conclusion because the abstract uh, literally means to pull out. So it's, you're pulling out bits and pieces of your paper and you have to put in the abstract um, everything, right? A little bit about why you did the study, a little bit about the methods, a little bit about the results, a little bit about um, what the results mean, the conclusion. So it's bigger, it's more, it's broader than the conclusion. The conclusion section just summarizes what you found. The abstract is, what you did and why you did it, as well as what you found. Um, I'll tell you that if I'm looking at a paper quickly, the first thing I'm going to look at is the abstract section, and the second thing I'm going to look at is the conclusion section. Well, also the tables and figures, but um, 
because I'm looking in the conclusion section, it might give me that take home message. I'm often looking initially just to get the take home message. The conclusion section is more focused. It's, it's giving you that take home message. And um, both of those should be written in a way that is understandable to uh, as many people as possible. But often, because not everybody has access to the full text, often uh, what's happening is people are just reading the abstracts. You, you have to make that abstract understandable. You have to give clear take home messages. And that's, that's tough because there is a word count, but all the things I teach will help you meet that word count because you can take out all the unnecessary words. And really, you have to be parsimonious. You have to think what are the most important points and get rid of everything else. And certainly a place to get rid of extra words and make it really crisp. Um, okay, so next question, what's your view on the reviewer's expectations? Do you think that in many cases they expect or prefer the writings to be difficult? Um, so, uh, and I know perspective of the reviewers may vary a lot, but before submitting, what should my, be my initial thought as I find most of the papers written in a very tough way? Okay, so uh, reviewers um, absolutely want you to write clearly. Okay, so I review many, many papers, many, way too many papers. Um, I will get very annoyed very fast as a reader if I can't understand your writing. Um, and so if you want to get your paper published, there's nothing you can do other than, of course, you have to do good science. But beyond that, there's nothing you can do that's going to help you get published more than writing it clearly. Because I read so many papers that I have to struggle through it. And I'm often the statistical reviewer, meaning I don't necessarily have very... I don't have knowledge of that little niche area that they're writing about. I'm not being chosen to review that paper because I happen to know the little tiny area they're writing in. I'm, I'm looking at the statistics. So it's very uh, hard for me if I can't follow just your basic, why did you do the study? Oftentimes I can't figure out why you did the study because that's not clear. So that makes me very annoyed as a reviewer. I mean, my other pet peeve as a reviewer um, is abbreviations and acronyms. So we have this terrible habit in science of writing with a lot of acronyms and abbreviations that we just make up on the fly. And so I was just reviewing something the other day and they abbreviated inpatient and outpatient as IP and OP. Well, every time I, as a reader, hit IP and OP, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have to go back and say, what was IP? What was OP? What, what is RCL? What is ACLR? And I have to translate those. It's like a foreign language. So that is very annoying for reviewers because, again, they may not be in your little niche area. And also, if you're making up abbreviations, even if they're in your niche area, they may have no idea what you're talking about. So just write out the words. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, I'll tell you, I do a lot of review, and so I see what papers get accepted in the end and which papers don't. And I've reviewed, you know, hundreds, if not, you know, upwards close to probably a thousand papers in my career by now. The papers that are easy to read, those get published. Um, you know, again, contingent on good science, but the papers that are really hard to read, sometimes they're rejected just because you can't understand what is done, and therefore you can't really evaluate it if you can't understand it. So yeah, absolutely, this is going to help you get published. Reviewers want you to write clearly. Editors, journal editors want you to write clearly, uh, especially. Journal editors know the value of good communication, so they, they are looking for well-written papers. Um, I always tell this story that uh, I had a a colleague, we had some kind of internal grant at Stanford, this was a few years back, and a colleague of mine said, oh, could you please sit on the board and, you know, read the grants and rate them? And it said, it will just take you one hour, that's it, just one hour of your time to read through all these grants and, and rate them for me. And he had, you know, a, a number of people uh, rating them so that he could figure out which grants to fund, to fund, and again, just an internal grant. So he said, so he said, it would take one hour. So I said, okay, I'm putting one hour on my calendar. That's exactly how much time I have. Now, he sent me 10 grants. They were each, you know, at least five or six pages long. Nobody can read 60 pages in an hour. I mean, I could skim read it, but I'm not going to be able to read it carefully, right? But I, I had one hour on my calendar, so I read them as quickly, kind of skim read them. And, you know, I felt like, oh, gosh, maybe I'm not, you know, spending enough time, but this is all the time I have. Um, one of them was written better than the others. And um, so I could understand what they were doing, right? It was easier for me. So that one I rated first. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm doing this too quickly and I'm not going to get this right. Well, guess what? There were like five or six of us reviewing. That one got ranked number one by everybody. So it was, and it's not coincidental, it was because that one was the easiest one to read. All right, so um, other tips for you. So again, you know, working out what you're trying to say, 
you actually have to understand the science better to explain it well. And you know, I do writing for the for lay audiences, for general audiences. I really have to think through the science carefully in order to be able to explain it simply. It's easy to kind of hand wave if you throw in a lot of jargon. It's actually really hard to uh, explain it simply. That makes you, it forces you to think through the whole problem really carefully. Um, you want to write to inform. The purpose of writing is to get across your idea, not to impress your advisor, not to impress your reader, not to impress reviewers. They're not going to be impressed. They want to get the information. Um, be transparent. So sometimes I feel like when I'm reading statistical methods sections, I sometimes wonder if people are not being purposefully uh, obtuse and, and trying to you know make it sound uh, make it so I can't read it as a statistical reviewer because they're, they're not confident that they did the stats right. So they figure if they throw in a lot of big words and make it hard for me to read that I won't be able to like criticize their stats. So, so have confidence that you've done the right thing. It takes confidence actually to be transparent and write it clearly. And then of course you want to learn principles of effective writing. These are the things I teach in my course and, and it takes practice. You have to practice them. A really good way to practice actually is to edit other people's work. It's always easier to edit other people's work than your own when you're learning these things. Um, and so I'll just quickly, I know you guys have watched some of my videos already, but I'll, I'll quickly uh, review two principles of effective writing that I think are particularly important and just re-emphasize re those for you. So you want to um, cut clutter, get rid of all those extra unnecessary words that is so important in clear writing. And you want to write with verbs. So the English language really works on verbs. And so it's really important to, to have good verb choice and to think about your verb choice in, in writing. And I'll just give a few examples here. So here's something uh, from a paper I was reading recently. It says, good mental health is related to mental and psychological well-being, and there was a growing interest in the potential role of the built environment on mental health. Yet the evidence base underpinning the direct or indirect effects of the built environment is not fully clear. So again, very wordy, and it's really great to read writing out loud because you can hear the wordiness. So I'm going to kind of go through word by word now and see what are all the things we can cut here. So first of all, good mental health is related to mental, mental and psychological well-being. Well, I'm not sure that that's very informative. It's basically saying good mental health is related to good mental health. So actually, I, think, I don't think we need any of that. I think that's kind of empty prose. So we need to start at there is growing interest in the potential role of the built environment. So I think actually the word potential is not necessary. There's growing interest in the role. And obviously, that means we're still figuring out whether it, you know, exactly the extent of that role. So the word potential is just extra. So there's growing interest in the role of the built environment on mental health. Yet the evidence base underpinning the direct or indirect effects. So I actually kind of prefer but to yet, but that's just stylistic. But the evidence base underpinning the direct or indirect effects. How about we just say the evidence for, right? We don't need the base underpinning. That would just be evidence for direct or indirect effects of the built environment. Well, we've already said we're talking about the built environment, so we don't need to repeat those words. So the direct or indirect effects is not fully clear. That's a mouthful. That's a really long-winded way of saying it's, it's mixed. The evidence is mixed. So we compare that down to there is growing interest in the role of the built environment on mental health, but the evidence for direct or indirect effects is mixed. That's much easier to understand. Um, we probably could even pare this down a little bit more because I'm not sure we need to say there's growing interest, right? We could just be direct and say the built environment may directly or indirectly impact mental health, but the evidence remains mixed. That's even crisper. Right? I gave you some examples earlier. There's one on napping and there was one on cervical reticulopathy. And I, I'm showing you now, I edited both of those. So I'm showing you my track changes in Word, just to give you an example of just how many words I was able to edit. So I was able to cut a lot and I've you know, added in a few new words, but for the most part, I just cut words. Like lots and lots of words can be dropped. And this one on cervical reticulopathy, you know, I dropped entire, a lot of things and just boiled it down to the aim of the study was to do this, right? So there was a lot of stuff that could be stripped from those examples. So clutter that you want to watch out for, uh, dead weight words and phrases, as it is well known, it has also been reported that, like in the napping one, it would be of interest to mention, all of those you can just cut. You don't need any of those for the reader. Empty words and phrases, things that are just so vague that they're totally meaningless, like the basic tenets of, well, what does that mean? I, that doesn't help me, I'll just drop that. Methodologic often is a kind of vague word. Processes, these kinds of words that are empty, that don't tell us much, that are not informative, or things like, you know, mental health improves mental health, right? It's not informative. Um, 
and one of my favorite all-time quotes in writing is, some words and phrases are blobs. <laughs> it's a great quote from William Zinzer in the classic writing book. But that's just a really good description of empty words and phrases. They're blobs. They're just blobs on the page. They're so ambiguous that they don't add anything for the reader. A few years ago, I just discovered that there is a creature called a blobfish. And so I love to put that blobfish in my slides. We actually have my, my daughter got me a, an actual stuffed blobfish. Because in my house, uh, when I'm editing my kids' writing, we talk about uh, wherever we, I find vague and empty words, I say blobfish, blobfish, blobfish. And we use the blobfish as an image of, of you know, a blobby, empty words that you want to get out of your writing. Um, long words or phrases that could be short, like instead of saying due to the fact that, just say because, or the temporal placements of the nap during the day, just say the timing of the nap. Unnecessary jargon and acronyms and abbreviations, which I already talked about. Um, so things like the autologous two revered host is just impatient. Repetition, using two words that mean the same thing, right? Saying studies and then saying examples, saying illustrate and then demonstrate. Successful solution. That's repetitive because there's no such thing as a solution that's not successful. By definition, a solution is successful, so you don't need to qualify solution as successful. Adverbs, I love adverbs in talking. I use a lot of very, really, really quite basically, but they don't actually add anything to your writing. They don't strengthen your writing, so you want to go back and take those out. All right, and then the second principle that I talked about in, in my videos on Coursera is writing with verbs. And so just two quick things. Remember to use the active voice and don't turn verbs into nouns. So a quick review of the active voice. So the active voice, the person or thing doing the action is at the beginning of the sentence and the thing being acted upon is at the end of the sentence. So this is the way we talk. She throws the ball. That's a very natural way to talk in English. The passive version of that inverts that. So it says the ball is thrown by her, which is not easy to understand. Um, and you can recognize passive voice in the English language because you're always going to have some form of the verb to be. There's an is, are, was, were, be, been, or am. It's always going to be part of that passive verb, and it's attached to a verb that's in the past tense. And it, the verb has to take an object. In order to turn it into the passive voice, it has to be a verb that takes an object. So if you say she runs, like the activity of running, you can't turn that into the passive voice. But if you say she runs the company, now you have an object, so you can say the company is run by her. You can turn that into the passive voice. Uh, favorite one of my, uh, my examples, I'm, I'm from the New England area originally, so it says, my first visit to Boston will always be remembered by me. Well, that's very awkward. Um, that's the passive voice, though. So if you think about it, who is doing the remembering is at the end of the sentence, what is being remembered is at the beginning. That's, you don't usually put it that way. So the object of the verb, what is being remembered, the visit to Boston, comes first. Then we get the passive verb, but again, it has a form of the verb to be that will be <clears throat> remembered. And then the person doing the remembering is at the end, which is really awkward. So of course, to turn this back into active voice, you would say, I will always remember my first visit to Boston. Um, now, this is a more subtle example of a passive voice. This is more what we see in science. It says, the activation of calcium channel is induced by the depletion of endoplasmic reticulum calcium stores. Now, that's very confusing, and it's a little bit hard to recognize the passive voice, but that is induced by. That is is your little clue that it might be a passive verb. You have a firm of the verb to be, and you have to think about who does what to whom. Well, it's the depletion of the calcium stores that activates the calcium channel. So that's, uh, again, in that inverted structure. So how would you turn that one back to active voice? That one's tricky, but it's the depletion that activates the calcium channel. So you'd put it that way. You would say, depleting calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum activates calcium channels. And notice that before we had two verbs, activation and it is induced by. Those mean the same thing. When you turn things into the active voice, sometimes you realize you don't need both verbs. There's some stuff you can get rid of. So you can just say activates and you no longer need induces. So it also gets rid of words. In, in that very, uh, one of those first examples I showed you about napping, that first sentence was actually in the passive voice. Considerable attention has been paid to napping. Well, who paid attention to napping? Who's paying attention? I don't know. It's, it's confusing. All right, finally, we have a really bad habit in science, in academic writing in general, of turning verbs into nouns. So we say things like obtain estimates of, or has seen an expansion in, or provide right? All of those could be simpler. We could say estimate rather than obtain an estimate. Has expanded rather than has seen an expansion. Emphasizes methodology rather than provides a methodological 
assess rather than take an assessment of. There's no reason to use the long form here. And all of these cases, we took a nice verb, right? Estimate, expand, emphasize, assess, and we paired it, we turned it into a noun, and we paired it with a weak verb, obtain, has seen, provide, take. Those are boring verbs. So we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that. Um, in one of the examples I showed you earlier on adoptive cell immunotherapy, the reason that paragraph is hard to read is because they have a whole bunch of nouns that could have been verbs. So selection, activation, expression, reinfusion, right? Those are all nouns that could have been verbs. Select, activate, express, reinfuse. And notice that in the better definition that I found, in fact, they use the verb forms. They say that they expanded the cells and reinfused them into the patient. That's why that one is so much easier to understand because they're using the verbs rather than the nouns. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up there and then leave lots of time for questions. I'll point out uh, some uh, other training I do. So of course, uh, you all have um, seen the writing in the sciences. There's lots of practice examples on that course. Uh, you should be able to access everything um, on that course. Um, I also do teach statistics. So for anybody who's also interested in learning something about statistics, um, I teach a medical statistics certificate program at Stanford, the link is there. And I happen to have a statistics webinar coming up this Tuesday, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. So if you're getting interested in learning a little bit about statistics, it's, it's meant for a fairly general audience, and I'm going to talk about statistics in the news. It's unfortunately at 11 p.m. your time, but um, if you uh, want to get the webinar later, you can sign up and they'll send you um, the, the link to that. Um, and feel free to email me if you uh, want those links later. Um, and I've got another question in the chat box. So if we want to emphasize the object, e.g. if we want to emphasize Boston, would it have been okay to use passive voice? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm often advocating for people to use the active voice rather than the passive voice. But I'll tell you um, that there are cases where it's actually fine to use the passive voice. I'm perfectly fine with the person using a passive voice if they do so deliberately and they have a reason for doing it. So let's say, yeah, you wanted to emphasize Boston, right? Uh, Boston, um, let's see, uh, Boston was remembered by me because you, you know, you, that you were trying to put the emphasis on Boston. Uh, sure, if you deliberately do that, if you structure your sentence knowing that you want to put that emphasis on Boston, um, or there's a great example I have in one of my slides. Uh, the Obamas, or President Obama was given an award at this meeting, right? Nobody cares who the per who's the person who gave them the award. They care that the Obamas were at that meeting. So in that case, yeah, you might want to emphasize who was get got the award. And you put that first. And so there are definitely cases where the passive voice might be appropriate. So um, it has a purpose in the English language. We just don't want to sort of use it without any reason to use it, just kind of because by habit. We want to use it sparingly and purposefully. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and then I'll just say again here that my take home message is a lot of the scientific writing is poor. <laughs> so if you're having trouble reading, it's not your fault. Um, this is a bad thing and we really need to fix that. And uh, I think you all can do better. And again, I'm gonna stop my screen share here so that we can have a more of a conversation. Um, you can feel free to type questions in the chat box or there's, there's not, so many on the line that we can't have people unmute themselves in. So, so feel free if you have a question to just unmute yourself and jump right in. It'd be great if we have a little conversation going now. So um, feel free to jump in with questions. First of all, uh, thank you so much for the really wonderful uh, presentation. I'm always uh, like, I appreciate how uh, clearly you can uh, explain the topics. And with this, uh, as uh, Dr. Sainani mentioned, the floor is open for a conversation. So if you want to add anything or ask any topics regarding her uh, lecture videos, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask uh, questions. Everybody's always shy to be the first one to, <laughs> to ask something. <laughs> Well, I guess I can uh, ask the first question. So you uh, 
I mean, uh, got a, a PhD in uh, epidemiology and then uh, went to a writing school, as I uh, saw in your uh, biography. So what uh, actually motivated you to switch uh, from an active research career and uh, pursue into writing? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about uh, careers with students <laughs> and sort of finding your own path. Yeah, I mean, I had decided um, pretty early on in my uh, PhD, actually, that I probably wasn't going to go into academia. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of factors that go into that. But partly, um, I had an advisor who, it, who wasn't the happiest woman in the world. <laughs> and I think I early on said to myself, oh, you know, like, I was a young person, I hadn't thought about who do I want to be when I grow up, you know, I was, I, it, that was too far in the future for me to really think about. But I actually had like an epiphany at one moment where I was like, what do I want to be when I grow up? And I was like, I, I know I don't want to be like her. <laughs> and I mean, that was actually a super useful, not to be critical of her, but you know, she, she was very, there was not a lot of work-life balance, let's put it that way. And she wasn't a happy person. And so it gave me this thought like, oh, I, I need to think about like, what, what do I enjoy doing? And I, I need to follow that path and be true to myself and not worry about like, oh, I have to do this path because it's, it looks good or something, or, you know, it sounds good. Um, and so, um, I figured out also that I don't like many parts of science, <laughs> it, the actual doing of science, I should say. So when I was an undergraduate, I worked in a wet lab where you had to pipette things. And I realized that was just totally not for me. I, I, I am not, I don't like to cook. I'm not good with, it just, it, I found it boring. And then when I got to epidemiology and I was doing my PhD in that, I, I did a study actually where it was on women runners. So it was a topic that was really interesting to me because I was a runner myself when I was young. Um, but you had to do things like, you know, get IRB approvals and like recruit participants and collect data. And I found all of that very boring. <laughs> I don't like data collection of any form. I figured out very early. Um, and so I figured out um, that I liked the parts where we got data and I got to play with the data. And I also figured out that I liked the parts we had a newsletter that we wrote to participants. And I like writing that. So I realized like I like writing and I like analyzing data. And I thought given my experiences in academia as a PhD student, I thought I didn't like academia. And so I was like, well, what am I gonna do when I grow up? And I knew about this program at UC Santa Cruz where they train scientists to be journalists. And since I was really enjoying the writing part of science, I thought I would go and do that. So I, I ended up um, after my PhD saying, nope, I'm gonna be a writer and I'm gonna go do that. <laughs> and I did that um, a bit of time just being a journalist. Um, uh, but I, I somehow wandered my way back into, into academia through happenstance. Um, I did miss the, I like the data part. <laughs> so I missed that. <laughs> and so I ended up wandering my way back in and sort of doing some combination of writing and um, statistics. But I'll say like, my, I, I planned nothing in my career. So for those of you who are trying to figure out your career, none of it was planned. Um, it was all by happenstance. And um, I ended up in the PhD in epidemiology because I missed the deadline for all of the other biology related PhD programs at Stanford. And I wanted to come to Stanford because there was a running team there. So it's all totally serendipitous. And so don't feel like you need to have a five-year plan. But the one thing I've always been true to is I've figured out what do I like doing and what do I not like doing? And I've tried to only do the things that I like doing. And that's a really, that's a really good thing. So, so that's a long-winded explanation, but I, I do like to give advice to students about choosing your career path. Do what makes you happy and what you enjoy doing and, and you'll do well in it. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about careers, anything. We don't have to stick on to the topic of writing, statistics, anything that you guys are interested in chatting about. Happy to do that. Okay, I'm, I have a question. Sure, uh, I have Can you uh, talk a little bit about writing a review paper? Because while writing a review paper, we are actually reviewing other people's work. So uh, actually, what should you focus on and what is the value that we are adding while writing a review paper? Can you uh, elaborate on that? Sure, yeah. Review papers are a really great experience. They're a lot of work, <laughs> um, more work than you think. Um, so I've done a few of those in my career. I think probably the most important thing in a review paper is understanding, first off, what is the purpose of the review paper? So I think, think sometimes students think, well, I'm going to review, you know, an, an area and they pick something really large, right? Really big subject. So I'm going to review breast cancer. Well, that's too broad, right? You have to pick a pretty narrow question that you're trying to answer. Um, uh, so, so keeping, so the number one thing is really to figure out what is that narrow question? 
in, in narrowing down the scope. And I think students often make the mistake of trying to have the scope be so broad that uh, it's really hard. There's so many papers in the literature. You have to keep it narrow enough that it's a, it's a manageable amount of papers that you can actually review. And then you really know what is it you're trying to answer. What's the question you're trying to answer through your review? Um, so that's the first thing. Of course, doing a good search. Um, it's highly recommended that you go meet with somebody who knows how to do a search, like, you know, the people in our library at Stanford who will help when you want to do a literature review, help you to make sure you're not missing papers and you're, and you're doing a proper search. Um, and then um, sometimes we are extracting data and sometimes, uh, you know, but usually there's some kind of data extraction that goes on. So having a good system for extracting the data can be very helpful or to the notes that you're going to take on the papers and, and organizing because, again, it's a, it's a huge amount of information and the more you can organize your information and get ready to, to write, the better. I also recommend breaking things up into subsections so you don't just try to have one big large thing of text but have subsections that point the reader to what am I going to be discussing, what aspects of the studies am I going to be discussing in each, in each section and having a good outline and good organization is gonna make that readable. Because again, these can be really large, systematic reviews can be quite long and you really have to make them reader friendly because they're, you're not adding new data to the literature. So what are you doing? The service that you're doing is to synthesize a whole bunch of information for the reader. So it's especially important in a review that that be readable. So really thinking about making it well-organized and easy for the reader to follow and making your take-home points very clear. Those would be some tips. Uh, hi, Dr. Sainani. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk with you. So I have a question from a different angle. Uh, nowadays, there is so much info available online that it's often challenging to stand out with right info because there are a lot of misinformation. A uh, good example can be the ongoing pandemic. Uh, maybe you know it much better being an epidemiologist that there have been so much misinformation about the COVID pandemic and the real scientists have been struggling to deal with those. So have you ever found it critical to convince about your actual valid research output when there have been some other conflicting arguments for general Yeah, people? yeah. Uh, so misinformation is a huge problem. This is something I, I'm, I'm really interested in because it dismays me it dis <laughs> that, that we have so much misinformation going on. And, and you are certainly seeing this in the pandemic um, where, you know, most scientists are trying to do a really good job and get the best information, but it's not, uh, you know, there can be some who are putting out bad information or bad information, not always coming from science itself, but people who are adjacent to science, the people who are interpreting the literature for, for the public, you know, who might be in policy, for example, I mean, that's going out in the US right now, as you probably all know. Um, so yeah, it's a topic of interest to me of how we fight misinformation. Like uh, a big problem in the US right now, unrelated to COVID is just vaccines. Uh, people deciding that they're not gonna vaccinate their children against measles and, and you know, routine childhood vaccination. Um, and so I've, I've written a little bit about this um, and some of my PhD students are working on this topic of how do you convince people? And, and the vaccine example I think is particularly good because um, how do you convince people who have decided that that vaccines are dangerous and you know it's, it's their kids so you get it like if you think vaccines are dangerous you're not going to take that risk with your kids but why how have people been convinced of this and they've been convinced through very bad evidence and through misinformation um so a couple of things there's there's an interesting um few, you know a lot of what people have talked about in this space is the the role of stories <laughs> and so it turns out that the human brain is not very convinced by data. So you can give people data and facts and, and it's, it doesn't, it, it somehow doesn't register with us. What registers with people is stories and why the, a part of the reason the, the anti-vaccine movement got traction is that people told stories. My child, you know, had this vaccine and then this, and then they suddenly regressed and had these bad effects. Now, it's an anecdote but it's convincing to people because they hear that story and then they have their own child and then they say, oh wait, what if that happened to my child? So there was a great website at one point where people from, you know, who were trying to, public from public health, who were trying to promote vaccine, actually told stories about children who had died of preventable, vaccine preventable childhood diseases. And we need to get those stories out there because people, 
hear the story about the kid who had autism or something and they they're they're fearful and then if, but if you tell the story on the other side which is a very important story to tell as well that can be effective in communication um yeah it's an interesting so i got a little bit involved in this i mentioned this magnitude based inference that's a statistical method that got popular in the sports science literature and i got sucked into not by choice, almost not by choice i kind of got sucked into it and the reason i that I, I did as much as I did on it and tried so hard to debunk it is I think because um, I'm very interested in this idea of misinformation. And this is an example where there was people advocating for this method who wrote a lot of bunk on it. And I was trying to go and point out the bunk because I think this misinformation problem is really a big problem. And this was a little area where I could, you know, have some influence. I can't, you know, convince people to use vaccines, but at least, you know, I, I could um, go in and point out nonsense in this one little area. But I, you know, part of me doing that was I, I was thinking, like, I want to learn the skills of what is effective. And it got me thinking about things like, how do you visualize, how do you make a picture that tells this story, right? So it was, it was a good experience for me because I want to debunk other things. <laughs> so I'm, I started there, yeah. Um, but uh, clear writing plays an extremely important role in visualization, I think, also. Making a graph that tells a story is very, very powerful in a way that prose or numbers are is not to be more tables. So I thought a lot about how you visualize, how you tell a quick story visually, and, and people have done this with vaccines too. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something on my mind and that I'm thinking about that I have, that I you know hope to do more in, in the future, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great. A... May I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, it's from a different uh, uh, aspect, I mean, it's not related to writing. I wanted to know in schools like Stanford, where the admission is centralized, how necessary is it to email professor before applying for a graduate school? That is a great question. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about things like admissions. Um, so I do, I do sit on one admissions committee. I've been involved in others at Stanford, and I can say it's very variable by department. Um, and so, for example, the PhD program that I'm involved in in epidemiology, we actually don't want students to contact professors ahead of time. And that's just simply because we're a really small program and I don't have enough funding to admit everybody I want to admit. And so what we found is that when we had a lot of students contacting professors and forming relationships before admissions, and then it came to admissions and we can only admit, some years we only had money to admit two people. Um, that everybody got disappointed, like the student and the professor who made that relationship because we just didn't have the money to, to support that student. So for our program, we actually don't encourage students to, to reach out ahead of time. However, there definitely are programs at Stanford that are bigger and a little bit more well-funded than the program I happen to, to sit on the admissions board for, where they do encourage you uh, to, to reach out and find professors who may have funding or may have research projects. So it's really variable. Um, I think you know it's it's never a bad thing to reach out to a professor. People are busy, and so I'll tell you, you may not get a reply. Don't take that personally at all. Um, you know, you usually have to reach out to many people uh, before they get back to you. But you'll often find that somebody will. You know, a lot of uh, uh, professors are interested in connecting with students and helping students, and so you may you may hear some back from some, you may not from others. But it's a good idea to just uh, ask the department that you're applying to, whoever's in charge of admissions, what their preference is as to whether or not you do that ahead of time. And every department differs, so it's just a good idea to just ask the person who's in charge of admissions or the you know the contact, uh, is this a good idea? Should I reach out to professors, or is that encouraged um, or not? And, and you'll see it might vary by place. Um, but yeah, I sit on admissions committees at Stanford, so I'm happy to talk you know, about the, you know that side of things. <laughs> also very interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah. And your session was really great. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Riva. <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask about anything. It doesn't have to be directly related to what the talk was about today. One recommendation I do have for, for students starting out, if you're gonna, if you're thinking of a career in academia, um, if you get the chance to, to review papers for journals, um, and, and often journal editors do want young 
um, you know, you'll, you'll do a better job because you're young and you'll spend more time on it. So, so um, do look for opportunities to review papers. It's a really good way to learn about publishing in academia. Hi, uh, I'd like to ask a question. Sure, great. Um, so my question is how important it, uh, it is uh, for a graduate student to have a research experience or uh, having a published article? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, I'm going to say it varies somewhat by um, department where, where you're applying. Um, certainly publications are something that um, admissions committees look for. Um, it shows that you've done, you know, you have some experience. Uh, it, so I think it really depends on the admissions committee. It really depends on the person on the admissions committee. So for example, I tend to be very, uh, you know, I like to see a broad skill set. So I'm not necessarily, um, you know, I don't, if you don't have any publications, that doesn't really bother me. Um, but there are other people who might see a bunch of publications and say, wow, that shows that the person can, can do this. Um, so I'm, I'm not as swayed as an admissions <laughs> person by a bunch of publications, but there may be some people on my committee who, who do like to see that. So certainly can't hurt to have publications, but it, it's not a requirement, at least on the admissions committee that I sit on. Um, and again, it may vary by department. Um, uh, you know, for admissions, the biggest thing that I use, um, I do a little test interview. <laughs> I ask uh, some, some basic questions to see your thinking, and, and I think that actually can be a very useful tool. Um, so I'm less interested in all the things you have on paper and more interested in just, you know, how you can think. Um, but again, it really varies from person to person. And so um, it, it can't hurt to have publications, but I don't think it's always necessary at all. Thank you. Another thing on admissions is, you know, I care about the essay, the personal essay that you write. And I think uh, I do talk about this actually in some of the writing in the sciences videos. I think, you know, be yourself and show a little bit of yourself. And I'm not looking for, I, I think it's really boring if you just read off your CV to me, right? So like, I did this, I did that, uh, you know, show who you are and what you're interested in in life. And I, and I think um, the, the, that those kinds of personal statements that are actually a little bit more personal often can be really powerful in terms of admissions, um, at least for me. Again, every everybody differs in how they do admissions, but. Uh, don't be afraid to 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 take a risk and and show a little bit of yourself in those essays. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharia Kobir has raised a hand. If you could go ahead. And oh yes, ask. okay, yep. Uh, I gotta find that on. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so you can you can unmute and go ahead and and ask your question. I don't know if I'm supposed to do something else when somebody raises a hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes we also have audio uh, connection problems as well. Okay, yeah, if you're having trouble, then just uh, feel free to type it into the chat and uh, it will also monitor the chat here. So uh, I think while he gets connected, I have a, I mean, a different uh, question. So uh, I was uh, looking at some of the YouTube videos. So it really fascinated me that uh, there is a growing uh, community of uh, science uh, deniers. So uh, I'm uh, really uh, looking at uh, the flat earth community. So they oh don't believe God. that the earth is uh, round and they, they actually, uh, I mean, talk how, I mean, science is getting more uh, jargony and how the, it's uh, non-intuitive for the common people anymore. So do you think any, how we researchers can help the situation w with our writing? And yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really, amazing the amount of misinformation and the, and the bizarre things that are out there and you would think none of this would get into the mainstream um i think you're probably all aware of the political situation in the u.s right now unfortunately um we're seeing a lot of bizarre theories both scientific and non-scientific being promoted by our own president um and so it has reached the mainstream, unfortunately. And yeah, the, the flat earth thing, I mean, of course it's crazy and nonsensical and you'd think that there'd be nobody in the world who would believe that, um, and yet it has a following. I, I don't know how exactly these things get started. And there's some cult aspect to it, I think, which is a whole nother psychology. 
Um, but I do think, as I said, that poor scientific communication, scientists talking in a way that talks over the public, and uh, you know, it's hard, you know, for other scientists to understand, um, does contribute to this because I think there, there's a bit of backlash, and I think what we are seeing in the U.S. You know, this is my personal opinion, but some of what we are seeing in the U.S. is a backlash against, um, you know, people who talk in a very elite and complicated scientific way. And that's, that shuts other people out, right? That makes people feel um, that, that, you know, aren't part of that club <laughs> feel left out. And, um, and I think if we did a better job of communicating science in a friendly way that people could understand and that not making science, you know, like the thing on napping, not making napping sound complicated. Every lay person can understand that study on napping that they did. There's no reason that it needs to be written in a really complicated way. But I do think it turns the public off to read stuff like that. You know, why are we making napping sound so complicated? And I, and I think there is some element of that backlash that gets people to buy into these bizarre theories. I don't know if they really believe them even. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories going on in the U.S. right now. And, uh, you know, I, there's probably a whole branch of psychology that deals with how, how people fall for these things. But I, I read a book recently that's talking about, it's not always that even people totally believe them. It's just like they think it might be true, right? They, 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 so it's this really weird psychology and um, what can we do as scientists? Well, we can communicate better with the public. We can make science not seem so intimidating, not seem so removed from the public's life and really make it um, more accessible to the, to the public. I think that, that's, the, that's what we can do as scientists. And we're seeing this with COVID, just making the science again accessible, you know, goes a long way to fighting science denial and misinformation. And somebody's asking in the chat for the, the link to that YouTube video. Yeah, I think if you Google like flat earth, it, it, this is a real thing. I mean, again, you wouldn't believe it, but, but it's similar to me as somebody in public health to the vaccine denial thing, right? I mean, you know, people have decided vaccines are bad based on a discredited paper that was published in The Lancet, you know, 20 years ago, where the scientists clearly, the, you know, this is the Andrew Wakefield thing, the scientist uh, who published that paper clearly had ulter ulterior motives. He was making money off it. That's all been documented. That paper has been discredited, and yet that myth never died, and, and people still believe it to this day. And so, um, so it's the power of misinformation, even when it's gone back and been discredited. It's almost too late when it's already taken off. So it's an interesting, yeah, we live in interesting times, I'll say that. <laughs> Yeah, especially regarding vaccine, uh, when, when I went to my grad school in US, uh, that's what also amazed me. So in Bangladesh, we have a very successful vaccination program and the communication isn't good. Sometimes uh, the village people, they have to travel two, three villages just to get access to a vaccine and they would vaccinate their uh, kids. They're even uh, some of them are illiterate. They don't know what it is, but they still would uh, trust the scientists and uh, get the vaccines and where there is a different community who has the all the access to the healthcare and then they wouldn't give it to their children uh, in the sphere so yeah this is also a very uh, unfortunate i think yeah it's very unfortunate and but yeah interesting to see like if you it's almost like you get too much access and everything and the health is too good you forget that they're that these childhood diseases they're not benign Right, and, and um, I think if you're living in an area where you've seen those diseases more recently, you realize that th these are real threats. And um, I think if you're living in an area where people haven't seen those diseases for a while, it becomes easy to get complacent and to think they're no big deal. Um, and yeah, I just, yeah, th that whole thing is quite crazy, but there are people really, really convinced and not, not uneducated, you know, people who've gone to college and, and are promoting this and, um, it, it's amazing how these things take hold and then it's very hard to shake them, even though there's a huge amount of research that's been done disproving any link between uh, vaccines and, and autism, for example, there's still people who believe that. And no matter how much data you collect, you can't convince them. And um, this is where it gets more political, I think, than, than scientific. <laughs> Unfortunately, politics plays a role in science as we're seeing now with, with COVID. So, uh, oh, I see I, uh, Farhan has raised a hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself, Farhan. 
<clears throat> Hello, my name is Farhan. I Hi. would like to ask a question. And my question sure. is, uh, what might be the impact of COVID in the future research or scientific uh, inventions or discoveries? Like, will there be more funds or more research in, into enthusiast in uh, like biomedical sector? Well, I certainly think that, um, I, I hope, I expect that somebody is going to do some better research in pandemic response. This is not going to be the last pandemic that we see, right? I mean, this is, we live in a global world. And I think what we're seeing now is countries were really scrambling to figure out, we have some, you know, in theory, you know, contact tracing and, and testing, and those are all great things in theory, but the implementation, <laughs> When you actually go to implement those things in a population, it becomes more complicated. And so I think we're seeing now that uh, pandemic response and how you respond to pandemics, having that worked out and having some science behind that, I think we're going to see that be a real growth area because clearly uh, the countries that have responded well are benefiting and the countries that haven't responded well, including the country that I am in, um, you know, th that has had enormous consequences and this is not the worst pandemic we could have had really there can be much worse pandemics that could come in the future so i'm hoping that there will be a lot more funding uh you know it, it, in countries to to study pandemic response and just the logistics of how you deal with this so yeah it's great to make a vaccine but it takes time so what do you do in the meantime um and of course you know research for vaccine and therapeutics maybe if, if a vaccine comes out and actually is successful, maybe that will improve public trust in vaccines again. I don't know, but one could hope that that might then get, uh, you know, there's been a, not a lot of funding for vaccines, for example, in the US. Well, maybe this will get people um, more interested in that again. Um, so it'll be interesting. This, this is definitely gonna have a lot of implications. I think COVID is gonna have a lot of implications for higher education. Um, as well as for uh, for the things that we study in science and the things that we prioritize in science going forward. Yeah, infectious disease is not one that gets prioritized in the U.S. as more chronic diseases, but certainly going forward, I think infectious disease is going to get a lot more of the funding. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Maybe there will be a new evolution in science after this pandemic is over. Yeah, Maybe. we're learning a lot. <laughs> we're learning a lot about problems in science too, because you know this rapid publishing. It, is, is actually putting forward in real time um, and in more public way some of the problems with science. So there was that paper that was published, um, yeah, I can't remember the journal, that yeah, on hydrochloroquine that was just made up data. <laughs> and that got the public to see like, yeah, there are problems in science. It's revealing some of those problems in a, in a way that's more public and maybe we will also try to do a better job on fixing some of those problems in science. Um, a question uh, from Tanvir, how, how important is CGPA in consideration for research funding for master's admission? Uh, currently, I have two publications where I was co-author and working on more, but undergrad, uh, oh, you're, it's, uh, this is your GPA, it wasn't that high. What are the areas I can make it apart from publication? So, so I think you're asking about um, undergraduate GPA, how much do we factor that in? Um, so first of all, um, I think admissions committees are aware that GPA means a lot of different things at different institutions and also in different countries. So we have a lot of grade inflation in the US that doesn't necessarily happen in other countries. Um, and so certainly um, in the admissions committee that I sit on, um, I recognize that there's a lot of grade inflation. So if you're coming from a US institution, you may have higher grades than if you're coming from an international institution where they're more uh, strict about the grades. Um, so that I, I think a, a undergraduate GPA is not, is certainly not the only thing that we look at. Um, you know, one thing I advise students is if you do have a low undergraduate GPA, um, you know, it's hard for me actually on the admissions committee to even understand how other countries do the GPA, but if you're coming from a U.S. institution and you have a GPA where I'm going to recognize, you know, two point something out of four, which is considered low here, that you're, you're best off addressing that in your essay, in your personal essay and saying, you know, I, I, I was dealing with some things as an undergraduate or I, you know, I, I hadn't yet gotten on the ball about things and, and uh, here's what I've done since then or you know I, I, just to show that you've thought about it and, and growth uh, is really important that you know I don't expect everybody to have a perfect college uh, career so just showing growth and in ways to show growth of course yes uh, doing some research getting some publication um, some people will will take some additional studies before they apply to the master's degree you know to kind of prove themselves 
um, so that you have you do some you know maybe some courses at a university uh, where you do well and you can show that yes uh, you, you are capable of handling the academic load. The only worry with a low academic GPA is, of course, it's we're, we're an academic program, so um, you know the worry would be can you handle that academic load? And so if you show other things that shows yeah you know what I messed up as an undergraduate. I don't really care that about that as long as you have growth since then and you can show growth. And we, and we look at many things in admissions, yeah. Okay, so uh, I have another question. Uh, if in a review paper I want to include a comparison between all the review processes of a particular system, and there's one single advantage or point that only one process has, should I include it or should I remove the point from the comparison as I don't uh, know what to write in that part for other processes? Okay, so. Um, you have some different processes and you want to say what an advantage of one is in. Um, you know, I think that's, that's fine if it's an important point. Um, it, it, maybe you're concerned that you're only talking about one out of all of the papers, but I, I think it's okay to call out a specific process or a specific paper. I don't think you should be hesitant if it's an important point. I mean, maybe you're concerned about like uh, saying this paper is better than the others or something. I, I wouldn't worry about that. It's okay to compare and contrast different papers and, and um, you know, you do so in a, I spend a lot of time criticizing things <laughs> in my career. I try to do those, you know, criticize things in, a, in as nice a way as possible. So yeah, I think that that's okay to do um, as long as it's not distracting from the rest of the paper. But if it's an important point, don't feel like, you know, you can't call out one paper and that's, yeah, that's fine. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question fully, so feel free to unmute and jump in if you if that if I didn't quite get at the question. Okay, good, thank you. Great. Um, other other questions. Happy to, to keep chatting here if you have more questions. Um, could you please share your thoughts about how the pandemic is going to impact the future international students planning to come to the U.S.? Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that is a great question. Actually, um, I I don't know. Um, we certainly had a lot of issues in my department this year with visas. Um, uh, and of course, that's because there's restrictions on international travel. I hope that, you know, as soon as the pandemic gets under control, and I don't know when that will be, but you know, maybe if we get a vaccine, um, that once coronavirus has been sorted out, that it will go back to normal in terms of uh, students coming to the U.S. I hate to say it, but uh, we have an upcoming U.S. presidential election, and, and as you probably are all aware, I think the outcome of that election may have some big impacts on um, how easy it is for international students to come to the U.S. Um, so my department, we love to have international students. <laughs> um, we have a lot of, we have probably more international than, than U.S. students currently in my uh, program. It's been really tricky with visas this year, absolutely. I'm hoping that's a temporary situation just due to the fact that the travel is hard right now because of all the restrictions and that that will not be a permanent thing. Um, and I do think, unfortunately, that the politics in the U.S. could have an effect on how easy or hard it is for U.S. To, for international students to come to the U.S. going forward. Stanford, certainly as an institution, uh, loves to have international students, has a lot of international students, and so we hope that there won't be any restrictions put on that going forward. But I do think, unfortunately, that there's some politics into that. And we're going to keep our fingers crossed that November 3rd goes all right in this country. Um, and that, of course, uh, coronavirus is is, uh, is a problem right now. But hopefully, you know, we're hoping, I'm hoping that doesn't go on forever. <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, Joelle, I think, raised a hand here. But go ahead and unmute and, and, and ask your question. And Joelle, if you want to unmute when you, or, or just type your question in the chat, uh, go ahead. I see your hand is raised. Um, I'll give you a second here. All right. Well, 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 Joelle is, is um, 
getting his connect or her connection going. Um, a speaker says, um, as I intend to go for a PhD in fall of 2021, is there any chance of reduced funding due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, so that is another great question. So yes, a lot of higher education institutions, including Stanford, are facing budget problems at the moment due to the pandemic. That is absolutely um, a problem. Um, and I do think COVID is going to interrupt higher ed, you know, has, has interrupted higher education and may have some real issues for higher education going forward. I, I don't know how it's all going to sort out. Um, right now, institutions are definitely in a financial crunch and that could affect funding for international students. Um, so yes, that, that is an issue. I hope again that it's a temporary situation and then when we get through COVID, that um, you know, a lot of that will reverse itself. Um, but I do think that you know, the COVID pandemic is, is revealing some things about higher education to us. So um, you know, there's a lot of students who don't feel that being remote and you're getting the same education, but it's not quite the same. And so I think there's gonna be a lot more online education that people realize can be done more inexpensively in the future. And, and we'll see, I, I'm a big advocate of online education because I think you know, the cost of education in, in the US, for example, is, is astronomical. And we can reach a lot more people through online education. There's been a lot of resistance to that, but I think because of COVID, we, we may see more online programs right, you know, uh, available that does open up education to international students. Um, and so maybe we'll see some positives and that there'll be more online programs that international students can access even without having to travel to the US um, and they will be less expensive. Um, but certainly right now we do have budget crunches here, which could affect admissions um, for sure for this year. Um, but you know, just apply, <laughs> hope for the best. And, and I think that it's so uncertain now with the pandemic that we're, no, nobody knows what's gonna happen. So we're all just waiting to see and go ahead and put your applications in and hopefully it won't affect um, your applications. But yes, it, it's definitely a concern right now. And um, uh, Joelle, if you wanted to uh, unmute, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question or, or type it in the chat if you're having connection issues. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. <laughs> I think, um, I think um, they're having a connection issue. So, so uh, in the meantime, does anyone else have a question or anything you want to chat about? Okay, while the questions uh, keep coming, I would like to quickly share my screen uh, for a while. Uh, so sure, yeah. uh, we uh, have a tradition of uh, giving a virtual uh, token of appreciation to all the speakers who come and uh, talk in our uh, program. So we also would like to give you a uh, humbly give you a token of appreciation on behalf of the IEEE Young Professionals Bangladesh and IEEE Bangladesh section so not only you gave a wonderful talk you actually took the time to answer all the questions for from all the students young professionals graduate students and uh, it was really wonderful to get your insights into the uh, areas of scientific writing improving it and science communication so uh, with this i would like to humbly present this certificate to you oh thanks that's very nice i really appreciate that uh, thank you so I would also like to uh, take a group photo with all the participants. Um, so ah, sure. <laughs> if, if it's okay, if you could, could go ahead and turn on your webcams, I'll do that myself as well. Yeah, we're getting these uh, Zoom, the Zoom photos. It's a new thing, yeah. <laughs> yes. And while you're doing that, you, you're free, free to add more questions in the chat box. Yeah, happy to keep chatting. So, and again, any any topic, it doesn't have to stick to writing. 
All right, uh, I'd, I'll go ahead and uh, take the first uh, page photo. second page Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, done taking the photos. <laughs> Great, well, if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to ask me. Um, I put my, my Twitter handle and, and uh, uh, email on the slide. So, you know, feel free to reach out on the email too if you have any questions after it. I'm always happy to chat. You know, about careers, PhD programs, and, and master's programs, anything you'd like to chat about. So, oh, and uh, another point I would like to mention is that uh, we recorded uh, this session. So after this session is completed, I'll sh uh, share the record privately with uh, Professor Sainani. And if she approves, then uh, we would uh, share it publicly later. Oh, sure. Yeah, that should be fine. I think I think a lot of my lectures are already public. So okay. hopefully I didn't say anything <laughs> that, I, that I really want public. <laughs> there may be a few political things in there, but I, I don't think I'm alone in, <laughs> okay. Thank you very in my much. concern on, yeah. <laughs> Great, any other questions? Well, if there aren't any other questions, it was great chatting with you. And again, uh, you know, don't be shy to, to email me later if you, if you have anything else you wanted to ask me, happy to, to talk over email as well. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sainani. And uh, on behalf of the IEEE Young Professionals, I thank everyone for joining our session. So after the session is completed, uh, I'll send you all an email uh, for, with the feedback form for the session. So with this, I would like to conclude the session and thank the speakers and the participants. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, madam.